We are indeed delighted that you have chosen to be back with us on this Lord's Day evening, especially our visitors. It's always a privilege when I have an opportunity to visit with some of you before and after services, so please stick around. If I haven't had an opportunity to speak to you yet tonight, I'd love the opportunity to get to speak to each and every one of you before I leave here tonight. Um, I went around and scrounged about eight copies of the Sermon Helper that I found uh, inside the building. Is there anybody that did not get a copy of our Sermon Helper that would like a copy tonight? If you can, please raise your hand at this time and uh, I'll get a volunteer to help me out. So uh, if you would raise your hand and let Brother Dan know that you'd like a copy. Uh, we've got eight copies left. So, But while that's going on, can you please turn in your Bibles to the second chapter of the book of Ruth, Ruth chapter 2, and that's where our text will flow from tonight as we look at the lesson entitled, Finding What You're Looking For. Now, I want to do things a little bit differently here tonight than we've done so far in our series, because this is such a beautiful text, such a remarkable point in the account of the life of Naomi and Ruth. I wanted to take the opportunity tonight to begin with a thorough reading of this text. And as we go along in the text, before we actually go into what's on your outline or what will be on your screen, I want to talk about more periodically what is going on in this text as we introduce our lesson tonight, because I feel like there is much that we can discover before we begin the application part of our time together. So if you will... As I mentioned, let's take our Bibles out to the second chapter of the book of Ruth. And let's begin by reading this together tonight as we begin our time here together. I'm going to be reading out of a different translation that I normally do. This comes out of the message translation. It is a paraphrase translation, but does a very accurate job here in Ruth chapter 2 depicting the account of what has is going to take place. So let's follow along uh, in your scripture. It so happened that Naomi had a relative by marriage, a man prominent and rich, connected with Elimelech's family, and his name was Boaz. One day, Ruth, the Moabite foreigner, said to Naomi, I'm going to work. I'm going out to glean among the sheaves, following after some harvester who will treat me kindly. Now, let's stop right there. As we come into this text, it's important for all of us to remember what has gotten us to this point, right? We know what happened to Elimelech and their two sons. And we know the choices made by the two daughters-in-law, first Orpah, who decided to go back to her Moabite family and to restore her relationship to them and to her former gods. But we know it was here, Ruth, who made the choice, as we were told back in chapter 1, that she would indeed cling to the side of Naomi, not just a, uh, a weak amount of clinging, but what? It was a clinging even unto the point of death. So this faithfulness to Naomi has gotten us to this point. But as is often said, at some point, good folks, you got to eat. And they are, at this point, destitute. They're in a very tough predicament. They've come back in to their homeland, to the place where they knew the promised land of God. They had heard that God had visited His people, and the barley harvest was ready. But they're still at this point where they're without the leader in their family, Elimelech, the man who would have gone out and would have sustained them as a family, provided them both shelter and food and the necessities of life. I cannot stress it enough what a different society this was for a young woman like Ruth and for a little bit older woman like Naomi to have found or some way provided for themselves in this moment. So it's that moment where Ruth says, I've got to pull myself up by the bootstraps and I've got to go to work because I know there's a barley harvest and the only way we're going to eat is what? 
if I go out and begin harvesting. So I've got to find, number one, someone, someone has got to be kind enough to let me go and work in their field. So let's keep going here. So Naomi replied, go ahead, dear daughter. Now verse 3 and 4, and so she set out. She went and started gleaning in a field, following in the wake of the harvesters. Eventually, she ended up in the part of the field owned by Boaz, her father-in-law, Limelech's relative. A little later, Boaz came out from Bethlehem, greeting his harvesters. Now, I want you to look back in what we just read. What did she, what did Ruth say she was going to be looking for by going out? She was looking for not an owner who would treat her kindly, but what did it say she was looking for? A harvester. Now, when you ask for something here, sometimes God gives you more than what you ask for, correct? And this is a pretty amazing point because now, back to our text, go back and look at it. You've got Boaz coming out from Bethlehem, greeting his harvesters. God be with you. And they replied, and God bless you. Boaz asked his young servant who was the foreman over the farmhands, who is this young woman? Where did she come from? Verse 6 and 7 the foreman said, why, that is the Moabite girl, the one who came with Naomi from the country of Moab. She asked permission, let me glean. She said, and gather among the sheaves following after your harvesters. Now notice, following after, not a, taking a leadership role, but just what? Walking behind, taking the leftovers, what they may have missed. She wasn't even on the lead role here, was she? She's been at it steadily ever since, from early morning until now, without so much as even a break. Verse 8 and 9. Then Boaz spoke to Ruth, Listen, my daughter, from now on, don't go to any other field to glean. Stay right here in this one. And stay close to my young women, Watch where they are harvesting and follow them. And don't worry about a thing. I've given orders to my servants not to harass you. When you get thirsty, feel free to go and drink from the water buckets that the servants have filled. Now, we're talking about Israelites, God's chosen people, and she would have been seen as a what? A foreigner, a Gentile in a sense. And those two didn't usually drink together, did they? But in Boaz's world, they did. She dropped to her knees, then bowed her face to the ground. How does this happen that you should pick me out and treat me so kindly? Me, a foreigner. Verse 11 and 12. Boaz answered her, saying, I've heard all about you. I've heard about the way you treated your mother-in-law after the death of her husband how you left your father and mother and the land of your birth and have come to live among a bunch of total strangers. God reward you well for what you've done. And one of the generous bonus besides from God to whom you've come seeking protection under his wings. And she said, Oh, sir, such grace, such kindness, I don't deserve it. You've touched my heart, treated me like one of your own, and I don't even belong here. Pretty powerful stuff, don't you agree? So tonight, the lesson entitled, Finding What You're Looking For. Now, the first thing that I want to talk about as we talk about this parallel between us as God's people today and our search for God's grace and the bestowing of God's grace upon us through Jesus Christ. And there are many great parallels here between what we're witnessing and what we've read thus far here in Ruth chapter 2. Hopefully you can see work, uh, grace at work here in this moment in the life of Ruth. So let's talk about, first of all, finding what you're looking for. And the first step of that is the search for grace. 
Now, you don't often think about going, as verse 2 says, glean among the years of grain. You don't often think of gleaning among the years of grain to find favor. That's not normally where we'd go look for favor or for grace. But in Ruth's case, she knew her circumstances. She knew that the only way that she would continue to survive and they would be able to have food upon their table is if, as I said before, she made the choice to go and sacrifice and work hard so that somehow, some way, she might find favor among the harvesters. You know, and that reminds me, I think it's very important for us all to be reminded that if you want to know the recipe, the recipe that is a servant's heart, this is it right here. You see, only a servant heart would have, under the circumstances, said to her mother-in-law, please let me go into the field and glean. Some would have said, Naomi, this is your land. These are your people. Why don't you go and ask a favor of someone that we may eat, that we may have the grain that we need to survive? After all, this is the promised land. This is your land. But no, in this case, Ruth had a servant heart. Now, I'm going to give you five things. You're on your sermon helper, and these are what I consider to be steps that we must all take in our life to have the type of servant heart that we see here with Ruth. And I want you to pay attention to each of these five things. They're not going to be on your screen, but they are something that I want you to think about. Number one, if we're going to be a true servant of God, if we're going to be that person who is going to search for God's grace in our life and find it, it's going to be through that servant heart. And the first step is you've got to make yourself available. How many times does it happen in our churches where the leaders of our churches are asking for folks to serve, asking for individuals to step up and fill the needs of the congregation, and instead of saying, here I am, send me, the reply is, why don't you ask somebody else? You know, on a typical Sunday, a lot of responsibility is undertaken by those who put together our worship services here. Prayer leaders, scripture readers, those who wait upon the table, those who serve in various capacities, whether it be fame or or joy hour or any of the programs that we have that take place on a typical Sunday. Somebody has to serve, correct? Correct. So I ask you, if you're going to have that servant heart, the very first step has to be that you make yourself available. Number two, you've got to see the needs of others. Now trust me, and Phil and I were talking about this earlier today, if you just open your eyes, the needs are evident. But I think sometimes we're afraid to open our eyes and see the need. Because we're afraid if we really do open our eyes and let God's light expose to us the real needs that are around us, we might be a little bit more convicted at heart than we really want to be. Because it exposes just how much there is a need for me to have that servant heart. And many times we're not willing to extend ourselves that far, are we? What happens is that If we see the need of others and we respond to that need, that doesn't mean that every time we respond to those needs that the person on the receiving end is going to appreciate what we do, correct? And they may not respond favorably when you reach out to help somebody. So we get a little bit um, of what we call in sports alligator arms. You know what I mean by that? How long are alligator arms? Pretty short. Number three, and this is hugely important. <laughs> and when I read this lesson, I thought, you know, I don't imagine that Ruth was much of a, a barley harvester in her day. <laughs> Before this story, I don't see any reason to think that Ruth was an expert barley harvester. But 
she uh, decided it was time to develop a talent, right? The truth is we've got to, number three, utilize the talents that you have. Look at yourself. See that God has blessed you with some amazing talent. The choice is, are you going to use it or are you going to lose it, right? Number four, boy, I can't tell you how this one is big, especially in this story. What if Ruth had went out and started following uh, in the paths of the harvesters and was picking up the scraps and really what they had missed, and she goes, you know what, this is really not worth my time. I think I'm going to go back home for a while. By the way, we hadn't even got to lunch, according to this story. It wasn't even lunchtime yet. This day's just getting started. But here's the key. She was faithful to her task, and we, if we're going to have a servant's heart, must be faithful to the task. And number five, and this is most important. You think about the humility of a young Moabite woman not knowing anyone under the circumstances, just going right out there in the midst of a person, a foreigner in a, a very different land than what she was accustomed to with much different people, and yet she walked right out there and she wasn't afraid to go to work, was she? But one thing that I can notice about this, she kept a low profile. It said that she didn't even pause for a moment. And you know, when you're working for your boss, the best way to please your boss in real life today is to do what? Keep a low profile and just do what you've been asked to do. When it comes to the church, when it comes to the servant heart, it's those servants who do so without expecting or demanding a great deal of praise who accomplish the most for God's kingdom. So keep that in mind. Also in this search for grace, now that I've given you those five steps for a servant's heart, there's one other part that always has to come into play when we're looking for grace, and that is you can never find grace without God. And in this moment, what you've got to remember, it was a sovereign hand, the sovereign hand of God at work in this very moment. She happened to come to the field belonging to Boaz. Trust me tonight, if you're here with us tonight, somehow God's providence led you to become part of God's family right here at Waters Road. It wasn't dumb luck. When my wife was diagnosed with cancer in 2016, we wanted to know why. Tests were run, all this, and the statement the doctor said, and I'll never forget it as long as I live, Mr. and Ms. Sanford, it's just dumb luck. I don't believe in dumb luck. I believe that God has a purpose and a plan for everything. Do you? So when she happened to go into this field, it wasn't just luck. It was God's purpose for her to find herself in that very field at that very time and to come upon the man who would certainly change her life. So that's the search for grace. And it comes to this point in the lesson, I cannot tell you this enough. If you search for God's grace, there's not a lot of guarantees in life, are there? But I can guarantee if you search for God's grace, if there's a person in this world tonight who says to themselves, I am going to search for God, I guarantee you they will find Him. So now we're talking about the discovery of grace. The discovery of grace. Notice in our text in, in verse 13, chapter 2 and verse 13. Now this is back out of the ESV. Then she said, I have, and I have underlined this in my Bible, highlighted it. I have found favor 
in your eyes, or I believe the New American Standard says, in your sight. My Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. You see, that's the discovery here for her. She realizes her place. She's not one of his chosen. She's not one of the dedicated who was chosen prior to this day. She happened to roll into this moment and went to work at the permission of some of the foremen there on that day and found herself right here in this moment with her Lord, her boss, Boaz. So what happens? We know what the discourse here in Ruth 2 tells us. We know the train of events that we've just undertaken together, but I want us now to look at the discovery of grace and what it did for her and what it does for us. Because it's one thing to say we've got God's grace. It's another thing to really know what it's doing. And maybe somebody says, Jonathan, grace is just forgiveness of sins. No, it is that, but it is far more than just that one thing. So let me, together, let's reveal some of these things tonight. Number one, there's five things. The first is, it accepts you. I've said this before. I'll say it as many times as you allow me to be a part of your family. When God says, come, he says, come as you are, but don't stay as you are. Let my grace develop you. Let my Holy Spirit transform you in the likeness of my son Jesus. So when it comes to this idea, it accepts you. Here we have a Moabite woman. Goes from a Moabite woman, a foreigner, to now he's calling her what? My daughter. Wow. That's a big transformation. Next, it directs you. Boaz and Ruth, they haven't known each other but a few moments here. And already his graceful disposition toward her has said these words, do not go to glean in another field. Why? Because she would not find the grace in any other field that she was going to find right here in Boaz's. Boy, there's a great parallel for us because in our turn today in our world, people search for grace in all different ways, in all different places. And any version of grace rather than God's grace will always come up short. It will always leave you wanting for more. You'll never be truly satisfied. And God's grace will always direct you in God's path for your life. Number three. Not only does it accept you, not only does it direct you, but it also protects you. Now, again, you've got to understand society. It was very uncommon, and I can't say this enough, for a woman to go out in the field and begin to just glean as she had done. Especially a foreigner. But you notice in verse 9, she has not a need to worry any longer about her status as someone gleaning in that field because as Boaz told her, I have commanded my servants not to touch you. Satan cannot touch you when you're in the arms of grace. Now, I know you may be going through some tough times, some of you in this room. And Satan might be firing his darts at you right now. But as long as you're in the umbrella of God's grace, Satan will never be able to take you away from God. The only way that you're going to be away from God is when you choose to listen to Satan's influence and some way, somehow walk away from God. As long as she would remain herself in this field and do as Boaz had commanded her, she had need no worries. The next thing that grace does satisfies you. 
Again, I turn back to verse 9. When you are thirsty, go to the water jars and drink. There is such a great bit of New Testament language that speaks about our thirst. The folks in Jesus' day, while he walked on this earth, were thirsty people. There was a very stale religion. It never satisfied, it never quenched the thirst, spiritually speaking, that the sons of Israel had. Only Jesus can quench our thirst. It satisfies you. And finally, and this is my favorite part of the entire lesson tonight, and that is, it astounds you. Grace is one of the most amazing things you'll ever discover in your life. You know, this is a space town, is it not? Famous for the phrase, Houston, we have a... And we know through their work right here in Houston, Texas, man would do what? Walk on the moon. And other great things have been accomplished, astounding things, right? There is no greater accomplishment that any man will ever achieve in their life, listen carefully, than having God's grace be a part of their existence. You could be the best basketball player in the world, the best football player. You could be the coach of the Texans and go undefeated and win a Super Bowl. You could be the general manager of the Astros and win another World Series. You could make it all the way to the Supreme Court. You can do a lot of things, but nothing is more astounding, more amazing than having God say, you're my child, and my grace is all sufficient. Notice her reaction. She fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me? How many of us say that to God? God, I'm not sure why it is that you chose to love me, to show me your amazing grace, but I thank you for it. That's our lesson tonight. I hope that as we continue this journey together, it helps you to understand some ways in which there's a great parallel between the life of Ruth and us tonight. If there be any need that you have whatsoever as the invitation is led tonight, if you need to respond, please do so as we stand and sing together.